once around Ton 618, one of the largest and most luminous objects that astronomers have ever found. So Ton 618 is located on the border of two small constellations just below the tail of Ursa Major, the Great Bear. These are Canis Venatici, the hunting dogs, and Coma Bernices, which is Bernices hair. And if you look at the stick diagrams of these, it doesn't make any sense at all because Canis Venatici, the hunting dogs, is just that green line that goes from Alpha Corcaroli to Beta. So somehow one line makes a dog or several dogs. And then Bernice's hair is just three stars with two lines between them and a cluster called Malot 111 to the side. Uh, and again, why her hair was in the sky in the first place just defeats me. But that's where Ton 618 is. So what is Ton 618? Well, first spotted in a survey in 1957, they were surveying faint blue stars away from the galactic plane, away from the plane of the Milky Way. In particular, a lot of these were white dwarf stars, that very hot, bluey, white coloration was a clue that these small objects were white dwarfs. But they came across Ton 618, and the full name of it is Tontanzilla 618, but that's a little bit hard to say, so everyone calls it Ton 618. And it seemed a bit odd. A photograph of it at the top there, you can see the bluish-white dot in the centre and that slightly separated red dot, which is kind of just another star in the line of sight. So what was going on? Well, the Tontanzilla Observatory, located in San Andreas Chula in Pueblo in Mexico, was carrying out this survey. And when they found Ton 618, they noticed that it was much more blue, decidedly violet was the description. And the two astronomers gave it catalog number 618 in the catalog that they were preparing. At that point, that was the end of the matter. It was just noted that it was slightly peculiar because it was even more violet, suggesting an even more elevated temperature than a lot of the other white dwarf stars which they were cataloging. But in 1970, the Italian observatory in Bologna noted radio emissions coming from Ton 618. And these intense radio beams were highly suggestive that what we were dealing with here was not a white dwarf star, but a much more distant quasar a quasi-stellar object. These were discovered in the 1950s and 60s as extremely luminous objects that were very bright and had a very peculiar visible light spectrum. In fact, the spectrum baffled people so much, the lines didn't seem to match up with known elements. And this was because they were actually so far away that the, they were suffering red shifts of 10, 15, 20, even 30 percent of the wavelength. Um, so the ordinary hydrogen lines were just not being recognized. And I think it was Donald Lyndon Bell in Cambridge who suggested that these quasars might be actively feeding black holes in the nucleus of a galaxy and the enormous energy of matter swirling in and forming an accretion disk around a black hole might be responsible for all of these uh, incredibly powerful beams of radiation that were coming out. And so what we think is going on is that in the center of the accretion disk, you have Ton 618, a supermassive black hole. In fact, um, these are extremely massive and are possibly now being given their own class of ultra massive black holes. Now, we have a diagram here showing Ton 618 in terms of its size, 2,606 astronomical units. Now, the known size of our solar system goes out to around about um, the orbit of the Kuiper belt. And so the diameter would be about 40 
the radius would be about 40 AU, the diameter 80 AU. So this is hugely bigger, 30 times the size of our solar system. And that radius of object is directly proportional to its mass. Black holes are very simple beasts. They have a mass. They may or may not have an electric charge. They may spin, but they don't do very much else. And so it's very straightforward to have a mathematical relationship, the Schwarzschild formula, which relates the radius to the mass. So radius R is m times 2g divided by c squared, where g is the strength of gravity, Newton's constant, and c is the speed of light. So if you know one, you can work out the other. And so to be this big, this must be absolutely enormous. And in fact, ton 618 is estimated to be 66 billion, that's a one with nine zeros after it, times the mass of our sun. That's about the same as the entire Milky Way galaxy. And it's 15,300 times more massive than Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole that's in the center of our galaxy. So this thing is an absolute monster. Along with that mass comes enormous power. It's got an absolute magnitude estimated as negative 30.7. Uh, magnitudes are, are a curious scale. Each step in the magnitude is a factor of 2.5 in brightness, um, and they go the wrong way. So the more towards the lower numbers or higher numbers into the negative they are, the more powerful they are. The, the apparent magnitude of the sun is around about minus 23 when you see it in the daytime sky. Um, so this thing is vastly brighter than that. Um, its absolute magnitude would be the brightness you saw if it were at a distance, not of the distance of the sun, but at the distance of 10 parsecs, which is 32 light years away. So if this was 32 light years away, it would still be two and a half to the power seven times brighter than the sun is in the sky now. And that is just incredible. Um, it's uh, as bright as 140 trillion suns. That is a lot. That's uh, a thousand times brighter than the, all the stars in the whole of the Milky Way galaxy put together. And this makes Ton 618 one of the brightest and most powerful objects in the known universe. And it's incredible that we can see it at all, given how far away it is. We estimate that it is now 18.2 billion light years away from Earth. But when we give that number, you have to be a little bit careful. This is what's called the co-moving distance. The light travel time to Earth is only or has only been around 10 billion years. Clearly, the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. So for something to be 18.2 billion light years away, you might straightforwardly expect that the light wouldn't have had time to reach us yet because it, it, it would take 18.2 billion years to travel, and there's just not been that much time. So how come we can see it? And the answer is that actually the light has only been traveling, I say only, 10 billion out of the 13.8 billion year age of the universe. So we're seeing it as it was a very, very long time ago, almost all the way back to the Big Bang. And the light that set off 10 billion years ago is just arriving now, having traveled all the way through the universe. But as it was traveling through the universe, space was expanding and has expanded considerably during that 10 billion years. Now, it had to travel through 
the newly expanded space ahead of it, and that will cost it the new size of space divided by the speed of light. But it's already passed through a considerable amount of space on the way that has expanded after its passage. And so it only had to pay, in terms of time travel, the speed of light um, cost of traveling that space as it was, as it met it. So the fact that it's expanded after it's passed through means that the estimated distance now, this co-moving distance, can be larger than the time in uh, billions of years that the light has been traveling. And in that same way, we think the, the universe is 13.8 billion years old, and therefore you would imagine that there would be a sphere of radius that around you, which would be your cosmic horizon. And it's true, uh, but the time for light to get to us from the Big Bang in any direction is therefore 13.8 billion years. But again, the photons have traveled through space that's expanded after their passage. And now that horizon is being stretched out by the expansion to 46 billion light years in every direction. Um, and so this is a little bit mind bending, takes a bit of getting your head around. Uh, but it's absolutely fascinating once you sort of get to the point of really understanding what is going on and the fact that it is the space expanding, not the galaxies moving through space, which is often uh, misportrayed in uh, presentations the media likes to give about the expanding universe, expanding from a point and being like an explosion and all the rest of it. And so that's really the story of this incredibly distant incredibly old, absolutely monstrous black hole, TON-618. But is it the largest one we know about? Well, it might not be, because there is an object called Phoenix A, and Phoenix A might be even more massive, up to 100 billion suns, 50 times the size of the solar system, so big that light would take 22 days to cross from one side of it to the other if it was passing across a length of the diameter of Phoenix A. So essentially about double the diameter of TON-618 and about double the mass, maybe a little bit less than double the mass, but uh, shown here. And we're not certain, we haven't measured this accurately, the best way to measure these things is to see some object in orbit around the mass and be able to track its movement and use Kepler's laws of planetary motion to help us work out the mass of the thing in the center. But it seems likely that Phoenix A is probably bigger and that that would therefore take the record away from TON-618. And it's located in the Phoenix Cluster, and this is a picture of the central part of the Phoenix Cluster, but that's another whole story. So thanks very much for listening to A Trip Once Around TON 618.